Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. All right, what's up, world? Welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. We are here in the virtual studio that is Zoom, i.e., every computer in the world is connected to the internet, uh, with the one and only Bradley, um, certainly a millionaire with many secrets, and we are going to mine into them and get to know him today. Brad, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Thank you, man. Appreciate you having me. Of course, of course. Yeah, it's going to be fun, and we're also live on Instagram over here, so again, welcome, or what's up, Instagram world? Anything you want me to talk to Brad about, you just got to let me know. Uh, Brad, so so let's get into it, man. I uh, well, one second, Jeff. Yeah, of course. I think, I think there may be a mistake. Uh oh. Yeah, if this is millionaire secrets, I shouldn't be on it because technically, I'm not a millionaire. No, no, no. I'm a multimillionaire. So, is there another show that I'm supposed to be on? <laughs> well, uh, I thought you were about to tell me that you're a billionaire, and and in either way, I would say that it is the right show because yeah. Just like I say, every month has 28 days. That's right. Every multi-millionaire right. is a millionaire, right? Well you, well, you got that right, but the B word is what I'm after. Dude, you and me both. I, I, man, if I'd known that this is where we were going to go, I would have worn my shirt. I had a shirt made that said billionaire in the making. Just so that I can't ever be a pussy or apologetic in this world about what I'm really after. And I, I feel like you feel me. I do. Yeah, that's good, man. You know, millionaire, billionaire, hell, Jeff Bezos is probably going to be the world's first trillionaire. To me, it's all about just what you, what you go after and what, what, what stretches your own personal horizon, right? What stretches your world? And for a lot of people, having a net worth of a million dollars would be like mind-blowing. But then, like everything, once you have it, you go, okay, that was fun. And you, you celebrate for a night. If you, if you watch Last Dance, I think of like Michael Jordan when he won like his fourth title and he like, he parties for a night and he wakes up the next morning. He's like, okay, cool. What next? Right. And I, I mean, I got to think that's how you are, whether it's millions number two or millions number 20, it's always what's next. Right. So maybe that's a good place to start. What's next for Brad Lee? Well, again, I started off to try to hit that, that, that you know, rich level. I didn't really know what the number was when I was younger. I just knew and wanted to be rich. And, and you know, what that meant to me growing up was really the ability to have anything I wanted, the ability to have all the cars I wanted, all the houses I wanted, all the toys I wanted, you know, the trips, the fun. I didn't really think, you know, of a, an amount. I just knew that it was rich. So as you start getting older and you start to realize, you know, all to come around to your question, what's next? You know, there's, it's hard to answer only because I don't think I've achieved where I want to be yet. So what's next is, you know, after I finish doing what I'm doing, I don't know. But like, let me, let me focus on what I'm doing and then I'll tell you what's next, you know, uh, you know, later. Cause I've, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't reached where I wanted to reach. Makes sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. You know, uh, I always think about Nelson Rockefeller, right? The, the son of John D. Rockefeller, who was a senator and a, you know, whatever else he did. I don't know. He was the son of a really rich guy, and which makes you still a pretty rich guy, right? But somebody asked him, uh, you know, John, Nelson, Nelson, man, like, like, how much is enough? Like, when is it enough? And he's like, well, just a little more. Just a little more. <laughs> and and I, I get it. Like, to me, I doubt someone like you will ever reach your goal. Because by the time you get within striking distance of your goal, you're going to move your goal, right? I, no, 
No? Billionaire. That's it. As soon, okay. as, I, as soon as I get to the B word, I'm done. I might even, I might even, I might even lower that bar, tell you the truth. You, you think, so you think like what, like 500 million would be enough? Yeah, you know, I'm starting to think 100 million sounded good about now. Like, yeah. you know, at, at 51, bro, I'm an old dog. I've been chasing the rabbit for, you know, a while. And then as you're chasing the rabbit when you're young, you're like, you know, I want a trillion dollars and, and nothing stops you. But now I'm starting to think, you know, I'm going to get to a billion no matter what. Why? Well, just because I'll die first, try it. Why? That's just how I'm built. But I'm being a little facetious because as we get older, I'm starting to think, you know what? All you really need, all you really need is enough money invested to generate enough passive income to sustain a pretty uh, decadent lifestyle and the ability to help pretty much anybody you want to help financially and otherwise, that's all you need. Right. And, so, and so to me, 100 million is that number. Yeah. Should I, I lower my bar, Jeff? Should I lower my bar just to 100 mil? You know, to each his own, man. I, I can't tell you. Here's what I know is that I know that if I'm striving, I don't even look at it in absolute terms, like a billion. What's a billion? If I'm striving for things that the vast majority of people consider to be unreasonable, then I'm having to show up every day as an unreasonably confident and effective person, which means I'm statistically a lot more likely to have a badass life. And that's the only frame I got to look through, man. If, if I get to be 50, I'm 41, so I feel old. So I can only imagine how old you must feel at 51, right? But if I feel if, 21. <laughs> yeah, good I, act, I act 21, right. well, that's, but, I, but I am 51. Well, I got, a, I got a hip and a knee and a wrist right now that are telling me I'm about 81. But that's because I don't know when to quit because I act like I'm 21. But, you know, regardless, man, I just look at it as like, what does it take? To, to be 10 times more fired up every day than I would be if I settled for what most people consider to be reasonable goals. That's why I wear the shirt. It's not because I'm like trying to flex some muscle I don't even have yet. It's just because I like who I am when I'm going after really big things. And so, I don't, no, I would tell you don't lower the bar, man. Don't. Yeah, well, no, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm kind of... I'm I'm kind of just teeing up something so the listeners, the people that listen to your show, yeah, will will kind of look at inside themselves and wonder if if they should lower theirs. Because there's a lot of people that are saying a billion, right? Man, that's inspiring. I'm going to go after a billion, and it's not even real to them. You have to have a you have to have an idea of success that's real to you. Mm -hmm. Like it has to be actually real to you. It can't be false. In other words, anyone can say I'm going to be a billionaire, but if you don't have an actual plan, an actual belief that you can actually get there, it's not real, right? You're never, well, it, it, you never say never, but you probably won't achieve it. Why? Well, because in my mind, you have to have a vision of your, of what you consider that number to be, and it has to be real to you. Is a billion dollars real to the average person? No. They'll say it, but they won't actually believe it. And that's what's important. See, what I always do, Jeff, is I, is I focus on five squares. Okay? In each square, there's an M. Okay? I just, it, it's just my M gauge, right? So at the end of the day, the first one you have to worry about is your mindset. If your mindset is not correct, okay, you're going to have trouble with the rest of them. So you worry about your mindset first. That's your mind. That's basically what do you believe? Because if your beliefs are screwed up, trust me, there's way more screwed up. Okay, if you don't have the right information, start there. But after the mindset, you go to the second box, which is your map. That's basically where do you want to go? What does success look like? Be specific. People are out there trying to create success. They don't even know what it looks like. I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't make any sense. So then the third one is your motion, right? The motion are your daily habits. What are your daily habits? Do they map to where you want to go or no? Because a lot of times people will be like, well, clearly they don't. Like, you know, hey, man, success to me means I got a six-pack. Well, then why the fuck are you eating the cheeseburger, fat ass? 
You know, I don't know. Well, why are you procrastinating freaking going to the gym? Like, dude, your emotions, which are driven by your emotions, your emotions literally will drive you. Those are your daily habits, wouldn't you say? Your habits every single day, what you do every single day, either moves you towards what you want or away from what you want. Would you agree? 100%. I'm obsessed with habits. It's okay, so that's actually the only place you can improve. That's the third one. Those are your, that's the motion box. Okay. Then there's the measurement box. Okay. The measurement. If you're not measuring everything, if you don't have the optics, you're flying blind. You're in a cloud. You don't know shit. Are you doing good? You're doing bad. You're moving away. You're moving towards. You're moving. What, what, what's happening? You're just sitting there because, dude, you've heard, oh, I think it was Will Rogers or someone brilliant once said, even if you're like doing good, no, you're going to get run over if you're on the right tracks, if you're just sitting there or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah. you got so you to you get clear on what's happening so your measurement, your optics are important. And that's that box. And then the last box is your money. When you start to kick a little ass and you start to get some discretionary money, what are you doing with it? Because if you're not investing it properly or you're not even leveraging it properly, you, you, you're going to take way longer to get rich than if you were. Like, like, dude, for a long time, I took all my money, which was quite a bit, and I just wanted everybody to think I was cool or, or, or something. So, so, I, so I bought tables and, you know, rented big houses and like, I lived a great life. But I wasn't rich. I was just broke at another level. You hmm. see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so I developed this, this, this you know, M gauge because you go to the first M, that's your mindset. If you, get your, if you determine what it is you want, that's your map. Then you get your motions down, what habits are required to get you there. Uh, if you don't want to do them or for some reason you can't, well, go back to the mindset because, dude, something's blocking you. You don't like yourself. There's a problem. Then I do the sacred six. But, and, and, and I'll tell you about that later if you want. But, the five M's are really just to kind of guide you. If you can master those, those M gauges, those five boxes with the M in each one, dude, the rest of life is easy. So if I'm listening to this out there right now and I understood what I just said and I'm 23 and I start applying this shit now, I just saved you 20 years of pain and suffering to get rich. Amen to that, man. I, the young people, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a trip right now and I've got, we took my family and uh, about 10 of their friends. So I've got like 12 teenagers in this, this uh, Airbnb with me right now. And I look at them and I'm like, my Lord, the opportunity you have, the time, the runway, your runway is like 80 years, 70 years long. If they, and, and right? Well, again, I would have before said absolutely. Nowadays, who knows? Your right. runway might be over. Like they better take the fuck off right now because dude, two, three years from now, if shit don't start getting better, we're all in trouble. Well, hey, we're talking about, we're talking about dude, crazy shit over here, crazy shit over here. You got freaking defunding police. What are they, crazy? Well, dude, you, you trust me, you call the police, you want someone to show up, okay? And you want them to have guns and you want them to be police officers. Yeah. Okay? You want them to be trained. Now you do want them to be trained I, and you don't want them to be dirty. But you do want them to show up. There should be no defunding of the police. It should be the opposite. Like give the police more resources to be better, to be a better. Yeah, service. you want you want better policing. Make police yeah, but, pay better. Yeah, but if the if, if people defund the police, dude, those kids don't have a runway. It's about to turn yeah. into freaking Mad Max. Then then you know. With the COVID and the mass and the and the agendas and the hype in the conspiracies and the hypotheticals, well, dude, whatever that is, because again, you can say, oh, dude, you know, this is real and that's not real, and the economy's fucked up. That's real. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the businesses are shut down right now. That's real. Okay, restaurants are closing. Like, dude, are our kids going to live like we did or no? Do they have a runway? And what's that runway look like, bro? Because it could be like freaking a runway right into some freaking future movie where, where literally we are controlled and enslaved. I, I, I mean, I 100% have like virtually no answers for you. I want to check in. So we're on Instagram Live over here. Have you, have you guys got any questions, thoughts, 
is the world coming to an end? Uh, uh, is, it, is it worth just blocking out and controlling what we can control? I mean, I'll tell you. So, Brad, the attitude that I've taken since March when the shit started to hit the fan is, you know, I, I think about what did my therapist tell me? What did my therapist tell me? It's no different than being in a fight with your wife or having your kids act up. You can only control what you can control. So put 100% of your energy into controlling what you can control. And if you want to control public policy, go, you know, make a, make a five-year plan and go run for office. And then you can start to weigh in on public policy. But for me to weigh in on public policy now doesn't mean shit. But for me to focus on looking at the opportunities in the marketplace and accruing as much capital as possible and leveraging whatever trends I do see happening to get, to get the, the resource and the power that I can effectively use right now, which frankly in the world we live in is money. That's the, that's the most effective way for me to control is to at least make sure that whatever's happening, I come out the winner, which most people won't. And I'll tell you, man, in the last five months, while everybody's been pulling their hair out, my business has grown 1,400%. You know, it's funny that you say that because a lot of friends of mine call me and say, how you doing? You know, everybody seems to be doing well. They're saying 100 million people are out of the job, but yet restaurants, if they opened up, dude, they'd be full. Yeah. Gyms would be full. Everyone has a gym membership. You know, our business is up. You know, mm -hmm. uh, all my friends' business is up. The malls are full. My, my wife still get, goes and gets shoes all the time. Like, what's going on? But I agree with you. You know what you just said, Jeff, which if I had a bomb button, I'd give it to you. You know why? Because basically what you said was, who gives a shit what the runway looks like? Just focus on today and focus on the prize and focus on the ball. And, and, and I guarantee it because either way, if world ends, you did that is what you should have done. Exactly what you should have done. Focus on today. Focus on the now. I agree with you, bro. Good yeah, you'll go, Good you'll go out happy, man. You won't be laying on your, on your bed or in your field or even if it, you step on a landmine and you got no arms or legs, at least you won't be laying there going, man, I really, I really wussed out. Yeah, because a lot of people will do that, man. They're sitting around worried about the headlines, worried about how long their runway is. You know, I was just, I was just mentioning it because my mind started drifting that way. See how easy it is? It, dude, I'm, I'll tell you a funny story. I'll tell you a funny story. So last night I uh, was talking to my executive assistant and she was telling me that her son just tested positive for COVID and her son about three days ago had come by my office to hand me uh, some, just some pieces of paper, right? And I, it was my pieces of paper that I used to prep for these interviews, They're like the little bio, biographical summaries of my guests. And uh, the printer at the office wasn't working, so she had her son run them to me. So he comes in my office, you know, probably about five feet away from me, hands me the papers. He didn't know he was positive. I didn't know he was positive. So I take these papers. Three days later, i.e. yesterday, I find out that he test, that kid tested positive for COVID. Yeah, but, I, but are you positive it's positive? Well, I, no, because I don't know that there's any certainty around those things. But I will tell you what happened. I hung up the phone. 30 minutes later, my mouth starts to feel numb. Hmm. And I'm like, like, I'm a, I'm a, I haven't been sick in like three years, man. I don't get sick. I, I work really hard to not ever have health challenges, which knock on wood. But, but anyway, sure enough, 30 minutes after I realize I've potentially been exposed to a, a, a carrier of COVID, my mouth goes numb. Like, like the feeling like you got shots at the dentist and you're waiting for it to go, to, to go dead. Did they say a symptom is, is no smell or, or taste? No taste, yeah. And so I immediately Google it, like mouth numbness, COVID, and you know, sure enough, no taste. And then like 10 minutes after that, I just go, <sighs> I got just dog tired, man. My arms felt like they weighed a hundred. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I got COVID. I, t I snapped my wife. And I was like, babe, I think I have COVID. I'm going to go lay down. So I go in my room I'm here for an hour and I'm like, oh my God, I'm on a vacation for eight days with 17 people staying in Airbnbs. And now I'm suddenly, I got COVID because I was exposed three days ago. Oh, what am I going to do? I laid there for an hour drifting in and out of sleep. I'm like hallucinating. I'm like so sick. Finally, after an hour, I'm like, this sucks. And I sat up and I'm like, babe, I have rejected COVID this far as a possibility for my life. I hear, henceforth, I reject it again. 
And I, uh, I sat up and I like just kind of did. And I mean, like, I know that I'm going to have so many haters tell me that this is such an irresponsible thing to say, but I'm telling you my personal experience and I shook it off. And today I feel amazing. It was like, as soon as my mind goes, Oh, you've been exposed. I had about an hour and a half of psychosomatic COVID. Well, that's probably what it was, dude. Psych <laughs> Psychosomatic COVID, 100%. And then, I, and then I, uh, I remembered who I am and it went away. So there you go. <laughs> well, you never had it. Yeah. If you had it, you still have it. It didn't go away. So what you had was what you just said, psychosomatic ills. And that's 90% of most disease, believe it or not. But, but that's crazy, dude, because I would have freaked out too because – my mouth goes numb. I already heard the notation thing. I would have probably tried to go smell something. If I couldn't smell it, I'd have panicked. If I started feeling dog tired, because I know people, two people that had that, that tested positive with symptoms. Yeah. So I called them and just said, you know, what does it feel like? What does it feel like? Can you breathe? Like, are you, you know, because I'm picturing if I get COVID, you're going to go, <gasps> and you can't breathe. <clears throat> but that's not the case. Everybody that I've talked to did say, however, that they got dog tired. Yeah. Like their energy was just zapped and they were just like dog tired. So when you, when your mind <laughs> said you got COVID and all of a sudden you felt dog tired, dude, my stomach would have fell out of my ass and I'd have been, I'd have probably been in that hole for weeks. I mean, I just, you know, I feel like I'm on vacation with all these kids. I don't, I don't have the luxury to get sick right now. And that's frankly, since the day I heard Here's the question. Yeah, go ahead. Did you bring them together, socially distancing, of course, and say, everyone, potentially we've all got COVID? <laughs> no, actually, uh, some of them are probably watching us on Instagram right now. And if so, this is the first they're hearing about any of this. Now they're going, oh, my God, just got COVID. Yeah, yeah. No, but um, in all seriousness, I mean, I know it's a serious thing, but I have from the day I first heard that, that icky five-letter word, I have just acted as if there was no new variable that had been introduced into my life. I was working hard before, I'm gonna keep working hard after. I was optimistic before, I'm gonna be optimistic after. There's no BC, AC life for me. And all I know to say is that it's worked and I share that with people perhaps as an alternative perspective that you don't have to let this thing rule your life right now and at the very least don't give it any more control than you absolutely have to and and i mean the one of the first things i did was i deleted all news and media apps from my phone and for a month i actually didn't even log on to social media because i just i saw what was happening and i felt what it felt like to even glance at the feed and i just 100 percent detached from social media until i sort of renegotiated my posture with the world and said Okay, I'm gonna re, I'm gonna selectively re-engage with social media, but in a way that's on my agenda, you know, in bite-sized pieces, and and it doesn't affect me now. And I'm just sharing that with the world as a possibility that I think the world needs, frankly. I wonder if any Amish have gotten COVID. You know, I don't know. I tell you what, though, I, I think I can tell from the Instagram live numbers that I don't think the audio is very good, so I'm gonna kill that. Thank you, Instagram. Love and appreciation always. All right, there, I killed that now. It's one less thing for me to worry about. Um, so listen, man, I, you know, I've, I've followed you for a long time, um, and I, I love your stuff. I love your passionate intensity around sales and your unapologetic stance that, like, sales is a superpower, and if you'll all get over yourselves and just embrace it, you'll realize that you can do anything you want in this world and that without it, you can't. Um, so if you're down with it, man, I don't know where you want to take this conversation, but I would love to talk some sales. Go. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of things that I will more directly attribute my personal renaissance and resuscitation of my life to than simply leaning into my interest in and ability to, and ultimately skill for sales. Yeah. Cause there was a time, there was a, there was, not, there was not a before COVID and an after COVID phase of my life, but there was definitely a before selling and an after selling phase of my life. And after selling, after embracing selling, my life got a whole hell of a lot better. Did you have a period of your life where you weren't sure about sales or you hadn't quite brought that on as part of your identity? Well, 
<clears throat> at six or seven, I was sent to sell candy bars for the school. You know, in the first or second grade, they send you around with a little candy box of world's finest chocolates. They send you home. Hopefully, you'll sell five, ten boxes. Well, you know, I went out and started knocking on doors at six or seven, and I developed a pitch and sold so many candy bars they couldn't imagine. And so that was my first technical foray into sales. But as I got older, I didn't really, you know, have a job selling. I just, you know, did side jobs and stuff, mowed lawns, things like that. But my first job, when everyone said get a real job, was this firefighting job. And it was so difficult and hard. And I got poison oak and it was just miserable. What I did know early at 17 is I don't like hard work. Now, when I say hard work, I don't mean you work long hours and you put it all in. I mean, you have blisters on your hands. You get, you, you, you come home dirty, okay? Your back hurts. You know, you are beat up. You're doing hard work, real hard work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got a taste of hard work at 17, and I said, holy shit, like, I do not like this thing. And so, ultimately, I realized that the people that were making all the money at this login camp, it wasn't the people doing all the hard work, okay? It was the people paying the people to do the hard work. So I just thought to myself, this is bullshit. I'm not going to labor like this. I quit. I freaking go open the newspaper and I see a job for selling cars. So I went in and applied for selling cars. That was my technically first sales job. And I made so much money the first month, it was unbelievable. And they gave me a car to drive and I got to wear a suit and put on cologne. And like I was thinking, holy shit, I just went from the woods, getting my eyes poked out with sticks and getting poison oak and that's part of the job and ashes in my face and up and down mountains with the 10 pound bag of water to, you know, spray out smoldering stumps versus here, pick a car. You get a free car to drive while you work here. You know, free Trans Am. Yeah, get a free get a get a car. You can drive it while you're working here. Get out there and talk to customers. Next thing you know, dude, I'm making six eight grand a month. That's it. Like so, so there's a before and after sales for me yeah. too. That's when I discovered sales, and then I spent a long time learning sales and mastering sales from all different people and types and situations and experiences, and then I just kind of developed my own. Uh, beliefs and style based on drawing in all of those different people's thoughts and opinions and then applying it with real life situations. Like again, dude, you, you can teach people to hammer people closed. I don't hammer anybody closed. You know, you, 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 you definitely want to follow up, but you want to follow up with a little bit of freaking class. You want to follow up with a little bit of value. You want to follow up with a little bit of creativity. You don't just want to freaking call every day. You ready to buy yet? 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 You want to build a relationship first. Like the first thing you do is build a relationship and then you'll sell those friends, those people, those relationships, multiple products if you're doing it right. You know, I have a, I have a sort of a mental construct, a, a visual that I think of a lot with sales. I'm curious your thoughts on this because it, it, you just made me think of it. You reminded me of it. So you, you hear like martial artists talk about the, like when you punch, you don't punch where a person is, you punch a foot behind the person. And that way the force of your punch is still accelerating when you hit them because you're actually trying to get to a point that's behind them, just mentally when you throw a punch, right? I, do, I sort of came up with the same idea in sales, where you're not selling to the point of transaction. You're selling to a year after the transaction, behind the transaction, that they're, they're still just as sold a year after the transaction as they were when you closed. And that mentally for me, it's kind of like throwing a punch. If I think about pushing through to beyond the point of the close, it makes the close that much more powerful. Does that, does that land or no pun intended, does that land with you at all? Sure, I mean, I see the analogy. Putting in extra effort, I think, is always effective. I mean, but, but I would believe that most people that want to improve in sales just need to understand the difference between, you know, sales and closing, number one. And then number two, the difference between a good salesperson and a bad salesperson. A bad salesperson, you know, can't sell anything, feels terrible, all this. And a good salesperson 
The slight difference is the good one knows, right, that they're doing it. The bad salesperson doesn't know they're doing it. Now, why do you think I say that? Because there's so many people out in the world right now, they do not say they're salespeople, but they are. Every single one of us are salespeople, folks. Oh, I hate salespeople. Oh, well, then you hate yourself, friend, because you're a salesperson. Everybody's a salesperson. You sell people on things all throughout the day. The question is, is are you any good at it? And if you can just get good at it, okay, life turns out a lot better. Okay, why? Well, because you get good at persuasion. You get good at letting uh, or, or basically negotiating your way through life, getting what you want because you sell the people on what you want. Now, some people right now will be thinking, well, that's selfish or manipulation. This is my problem with, with that. It isn't, okay? If I can get all of you guys to send me $20 right now and it would give me $200 million, why would it be bad that I ask you all for $20? Well, that's, you know, you got to just get rid of the things that we've learned in the past. You have to unlearn things. Too many people are looking to learn something when in reality – it's more important that you unlearn something. You know what I mean? Unlearn the fact that, that, that money and sales is a bad thing. Salespeople is literally almost like the number one worst, you know, mm -hmm. stereotype. Oh, you're a salesman. Oh, he's a salesman. Oh, he's a salesman. You know, hey, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a salesman for such and such. Oh, you're a salesman. You ever get that? Uh, yeah, I, there's a huge stigma around it. That's why I asked if we could talk about it. I am trying to, well, among other things in my life, I am trying to seriously destigmatize sales and have people see it for the beautiful art and science that it is. Well, again, you're going to have to battle uphill because there's a lot of people that think that ultimately that's taking advantage. And if you if you've got some slick abilities to talk people out of their hard earned money. Like, you know what I mean? The mindset is like, that's, those are the people I'm trying to reach because folks, you're a salesperson. You're just a bad one. It doesn't make any sense. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like prejudice against your, yourself. Like, like if I sat there and laughed at you because you were, you know, uh, 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 Italian. Oh, hi, you're Italian and I'm Italian. Like, it doesn't make sense. It, we're the same folks. I, I got an analogy for you. I live in the state of Utah. State of Utah is generally uh, dominated by a certain thought type that stems from the Mormon church, right? Like I don't, I'm not painting the whole state with the same brush. There's a lot of all types of people. There's all types of Mormons. It doesn't matter. But in general, there is a sort of a, a conservative, almost call it slightly puritanical vibe in this state around like, you know, girls yeah. not wearing tank tops. They need to have arms. Yeah, it's, it's the ethos in, in, in Utah. Did you know that Utah has the highest per capita rate of sex crimes of any state in the country? Because generally, the environment here has people at war with themselves. Oh, sex is perversion. Lust is perversion. This is, you know, not anointed by God, whatever. All you're doing is repressing your actual human nature and then you go act it out in secret when no, none of your people are watching and you and people are going, we have all these rapists because sex is so bad that it can only be bad. That's how people are about sales. They've created a, a, a reli almost religious level of, of mindset perspective against this thing when in reality they're only just hurting themselves and repressing their actual nature that as human beings to survive, we have to sell all the time. Well, it's funny. That's a funny analogy you used. Um, it becomes a dirty thing, right? Yeah, but again, you know, folks, that is a fact. You, you definitely want to make sure that you understand sales. And I always say sales and persuasion. Why? Because, you know, are you selling your wife when, when you persuade her to, to go to the restaurant you want to go to? You know, or is that her being nice? You know, is your kid persuading you to let them stay up an hour later? Or is that you just loving your kid and wanting them to, to enjoy life? You know, what is sales anyway? 
You know, what, what, what is sales? So when you look at sales and persuasion together, and you realize that it's almost like a dance move where if you're looking at a ballroom dancer and you're a familiar with dancing and you're like, dude, they're doing the waltz. How do I know? Because that's the waltz. Mm -hmm. There's moves and techniques and, and procedures and, and, and processes in a sales environment that are, that are more strict than in the life environment. Like, you know, if I'm, if I'm in a car lot selling you a car, there's certain steps and things to do. But what if I'm just a friend of yours selling you on freaking loaning me some money or selling you on getting me a job or selling you on introducing me to your sister or whatever? Like at the end of the day, dude, that sales. So everybody's doing it right now. The difference is if you're, if you're unaware that you're doing it, you're bad. You're a bad salesperson if you're unaware you're doing it. So I'm trying to wake everybody up to where you are doing it. We all are doing it. We've been doing it since the day we were born. Yeah, I, I, I'm crying for, a, crying for a fresh areola <laughs> is, is selling. Yeah, we're hard selling. Saying, I'm not going to stop making this shrill, merciless sound unless you give me some boo. Period. <laughs> now that's selling. Okay. And then we go through our entire life selling and then certain people get taught that sales is bad. Wanting money is bad. Sex is bad. You know, all of these things and all of these notions that we're supposed to just to, just to adopt and then some of us just adopt them because we were told to. And then some of us develop this disdain for those who didn't. So like the salesperson, you know, to me, as soon as I discovered, holy crap, I'm making more than these workers, these hard laborers, like three, four times as much as them in a suit. To me, that just, you couldn't, you couldn't call me enough dirty names and, and, and stereotype me to a point that I wanted to leave that and go back to the hard work. Like, dude, fine, I'm a scammer, okay? Me and my scamming ass will be over here in my, in my suit, in my kick-ass condo, driving my kick-ass car. You guys, you guys go over there and tell me you're not salespeople because they, they are. Yeah, you know, and I think that- Almost, almost sounds like I'm, I'm sour. Yeah, well, I mean, the world, you know, eventually we can't help but sort of reflect the world that we exist in. And, and I'm with you, man. I mean, when I was 20, what was I, 29, I was in a crap load of debt. I was basically a really bad salesperson. I had, I had been trying to start businesses all through my 20s. I wanted a better life, but I didn't realize sales and marketing is business. Like if you're a dentist, your job is not to work on teeth. Your product is working on teeth. Your job is to sell yourself as the most qualified, attractive candidate in town to work on people's teeth and then deliver the product when they happen to be in the chair. 100%. And I, I realized that and I sort of out of sheer desperation, the thing is I think you get to a point where, like you said, maybe it was having blisters on your hands or you know, sticks in your eyes where you're like, this sucks so bad, man. What else can I do? And you, you, then you kind of discover your true created nature as a salesperson. For me, it was when I was 29 years old and I was in so much debt that the only way I was going to get out was to sell my way out. And, uh, and, and then once you do it, you know, I, I, it's easy to say, oh, nice car. You look at the, look at the trappings of sales and the nice cars and whatever. But the reality is, man, there is nothing more selfish than poverty because when you're poor you literally cannot afford to think about anyone but yourself you can't it's it's maslow's hierarchy man like if there's a, a a pork chop on the table and you haven't eaten in six days you have you are not going to be generous in that moment but when you have abundance then you have to share and there's a lot and it's funny man because there have been a lot of things that have happened in my life over the last several years where, yeah, maybe I've been, oh, he's a marketer. Like people say, Jeff's an internet marketer. And they say it like it's like this terrible thing. I'm like, well, I'm, the digital economy is $3 trillion and it's, run, it's driven by marketers. Like, are we supposed to apologize for creating tax revenue? I don't know. But, but man, when people need something, when people need a soft landing or they need somebody that can pay for a medical treatment that insurance won't cover, who do they go to? They're, they're the, the poor uncle? 
or they just sit there and complain and whine and blame people that didn't sit around and do nothing. Yeah. And so that's why I tell people the five, the five boxes with the M's, the mindset, a lot of most people's problem is their mindset. Then if, the, if it's not your mindset, you're totally willing, you're totally open, you're, you're, you're learning new things, your mind is expanding. Well, then you go to the next box. Is it your map? Do you have a clear definition of what you want? I'm doing everything I'm supposed to. Okay, well then are, are you measuring correctly? And then they go, oh shit, I'm not measuring correctly. I guess I'm not doing everything I should have been doing. Okay, go back, fix that. Boom, now your daily habits are adjusted. Why? Because your measurement was screwed up. Now you're realizing you got this to do instead of that. Boom, and then it adjusts. And next thing you know, man, those five boxes just always continue to be utilized to, to fix your entire life, including relationships. And then the money box, remember, if you're, if you're making a bunch of money, but you're not using it. You know, I know a guy, he came to me, he said he'll give me $25,000 to coach it. And I'm like, I don't really coach people. And he said, well, I, I've been stuck and I can't seem to freaking do anything. And I've been watching you and you're exploding. You're all over the internet. You're getting hundreds of thousands of followers. What are you doing? And I need you to help me figure out my shit. So I said, okay, well, I don't need to charge you. I said, let me just ask you a couple of questions. I said, so what's the problem? Like, are you broke? He said, no, I'm not broke. I got a million dollars in the bank. And I said, oh, okay, cool. Well, we'll take like $100,000 of that and start basically hiring people. I gave him a plan, you know, basically take 100,000 of it and start hiring these people to get this shit done. And then take another $100,000 of it and start putting it here. And then take another $100,000 of it and start putting it here. And he said, dude, that's $300,000. And I said, yeah. And he said, dude, uh, I can't afford spending $300,000. What if it doesn't work? And I'm thinking to myself, dude, you're your own problem. You've got money, which is a tool, but you refuse to use it in case you lose it. But what you don't understand, folks, is money is a tool. It's, it's like if I come to your house and you're trying to build a dog house for your dog and you got a butter knife in your hand and you're trying to, you know, saw with a butter knife and you're trying to screw screws in with a butter knife. And I'm like looking to my left and you have a whole tool shed there, a whole entire tool shed filled with freaking everything you need. And I say, why are you using a butter knife? Why don't you use those tools right there? And you tell me you're saving those tools. <laughs> you're saving those tools. And, and I say, what do you mean? Well, well, I don't want to use those tools because what if the doghouse doesn't get built? Like, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. So if people can shift their perspective to understand the money you have is the tool that you, that you have to your, your disposal. And if you don't use it, Jeff, you lose it. Okay. Nobody saved their way to wealth. Okay. They've saved and then invested. They've saved and then invested. Nobody saved their way to wealth. Yeah. I, okay? I, I want to take a beat on that statement. Cause every, every show I look for like takeaways, nobody saved their way to wealth. I, I literally had this conversation 24 hours ago with a guy. He's a civil engineer which is great, the world needs those, but I'm like, dude, map, map your life out over the next 40 years. This guy's in his 20s, he's got time. But I'm like, for your family, if not for you, for your family, how are you gonna retire at a decent standard with what you're doing? And I said, nobody saves their way to wealth. People need to hear that because that's so against the grain. It's like you said, man, that's, we're, 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 we're preaching heresy here, man. Like a thousand years ago, they would have, Cut our tongues out. Well, here's what I tell people. Now, listen, it, it, to me, it's all perspective. Let's not keep it, you know, to ourselves if we're, if we're uh, in possession of some secrets, right? So I'm going to give you this big secret. It's rocket science. Right? Millionaire really secrets. That's the show, man. Please share. Okay, so I'm going to give you these secrets. These are, these are secrets that nobody knows. But when I get done saying them, you'll be like, dude, come on. Well, Guys, it's not rocket science. Listen to me. When you wake up in the morning, okay, you wake up, you start to think, man, I got these bills. I got to go to work. I got to take the kids to school. Uh, my car's not been working very well, and I got pet bills to pay. You know, I have to pay that, and I got to, and all of a sudden, everything's negative. Now, if I said to you, I'll give you a million dollars cash, 
what would you feel like? Oh, relief, enthusiasm, and exuberance, excitement. Okay, great. What if I told you I'll give you a million, but you won't wake up tomorrow? No, I, you know, I pass. All right, so what you're saying and acknowledging is that waking up in the morning is worth more than $1 million, but yet you wake up bummed out that you get to do things. You're bummed out that you get to fix your car. You get to go to work. You get to deal with problems. Because guess what? If you didn't wake up, you'd be begging to get back to your life. You'd be begging to freaking have the troubles that you had. Think about that. So I call it the million dollar morning because if someone just applies this every single day, they're gonna, they're gonna improve their life drastically. Every day you need to wake up. I, I couldn't always remember, so I put a sign on my wall that said, congratulations, you get another day, bitch. You know, I just put a little poster board. And so when I opened my eyes and looked around the room, you know, I saw the sign and it made me remember, damn it, that's true because you can't argue that. I would not take a million dollars to not wake up. So whenever I saw that sign, I just thought, Dude, and I got up with such enthusiasm that everything became an opportunity. It was an opportunity to go to work, to, to deal with my problems. It was an opportunity. And that little perspective shift made all the difference. I, it, it gave me instant, real gratitude. So write that down if you have to. But, you know, you got to have the gratitude on a daily basis. Shit needs to be an opportunity, okay? Not a freaking drag, okay? Now, number two, there's four things you want to focus on every single morning. Your health, because without your health, you'll give up all your money for sure to get your health back. So your health's the most important thing. So you wake up, if you don't spend, you know, an hour on your health or 15 minutes minimum. I always tell people, it's an hour total, but 15 minimum. I say do more on your health, but the health, focus on it every morning, at least 15 minutes. People say, oh, I can't afford a gym membership. Move your fat ass up and down in the air. Okay, like do some push-ups, okay? Get your, get your thighs slapping, okay? Jump up and down. Quit acting like you cannot get busy and get the blood pumping. It is an excuse, people. If you cannot do it, it's an excuse. Which, by the way, go back to your first box. It's a mindset problem. You don't like yourself. You don't think you deserve better health. You don't think you deserve these things. So you literally rationalize and choose not to do it or come up with reasons why you can't when in reality you could you just don't want to we got to figure out why but assuming you can focus on your health then focus on your relationships because relationships is the new currency man I'm telling you all my big multi-million dollar deals are based on relationships and they always will be and so have, so have yours been you know it's not it's not trust me relationships more hands you shake more money you make so every day, write down five names of people you want to develop a relationship with or strengthen a relationship with and just send them a note, send them an email, send them a video, send them a gift, whatever, and just say you love them, appreciate them, thank them, something positive, and you'll watch those relationships flourish. Too many times we're ignoring relationships. Like I go years without talking to people and I totally like them, but so I focus on that, right? Relationships every day. And then I move down from relationships to money. Because that's how important money should be to you. And people are, oh, it's not about the money. Well, it should be about the money. Okay, because money allows us to reach our full potential. Because in order to reach our full potential and develop, we need access to things. And access to things takes money. Okay, so to reach your potential, you have to have money. You cannot reach your potential without access to things like culture and gyms and, and Botox or whatever the hell it is you think excellence is. So you want to focus on your money by simply writing down five things every morning that you have to do before you go to bed that drives revenue. I'm focusing on driving revenue. When you focus on shit, it grows. And when you ignore it, it dies. And the last one is your mind. You have to get new information. Every single day I wake up and I'm thinking, I need to get new information. New information. There's a book I haven't read. Here's a podcast I haven't heard. I need new information. You know why? Because you're getting what you're getting because you're doing what you're doing. <clears throat> and you're doing what you're doing because you believe what you believe. And you believe what you believe because of the information that you have. N not that you don't have. Whatever information you have and you chose to believe is what you believe. When your beliefs cause your actions, your actions cause your results. So if you're tired of getting what you're getting, you got to change what you're doing. To change what you're doing, you have to change what you believe 
And the only way to change what you believe is to get new information. See, we change our mind with new information. So like I could have said, you know, I'm not doing this podcast. Someone says, why? Oh, that Jeff Lerner dude, he's a fucking prick. And then I'm like, well, what makes you think that? Oh, this guy freaking thinks he's so good. No, 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 man. He's doing this good and that good. I start reading a few things about you and I'm like, oh, shit, dude. This guy, is, this guy seems to be a good dude. Well, why did I change my mind? Well, because I, I got new information, right? So I, I only say that just so people follow the, the, the simplicity of if you want to change your life. If you want to change your life, you literally have to change what you're doing to change what you're getting. Right? And change what you're doing. You have to change what you believe. And the only way to change your mind is to receive new information. So why are we not doing it every single day? Not, oh, it's the weekend. We're off. No, no, no. Every day you do the million dollar morning, you wake up as if you just got a million dollars cash. Feel that way when you rise up. You rise up quick. You're not stretching. You're freaking bounding out of bed. Okay? Everything's enthusiastic. Boom, you go right to your health, you start working out, you get your blood pumping, you have one nutritious meal, boom, you figure out what relationships you want to build, boom, you figure out the five things that you want to drive revenue for the day, boom, I need some new information in my head, hour, two hours goes by, and now you are ready for the day. That Now you are ready for the day. And by the way, I'd recommend that you plan the night before, but that's beside the point. That's the million dollar morning, and if you guys do that consistently for 90 days, man, you're going to change your life. What time do you get up in the mornings? Between four and five. I, you know, I don't need an alarm anymore, but whenever my eyes open, I'm trained now after all this time. Whenever my eyes open, dude, boom, covers come off and I'm up, dude, like damn. And by the way, if you got shit going on in your life, you want to get up. Yeah. Now, 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 I'm not saying that like I've never slept in, but when I sleep in, it's like 6.30 or 7.00. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so at the end of the day, I open my eyes usually around five o'clock, four fifty eight, five o'clock. I just, boom, my eyes open. I look at the clock. I always look at the clock. Sometimes I'll wake up at like two 30 and I'll go, dude, that's too damn early. Mm -hmm. So when my eyes open, I pop out of bed. I go through those four things. Sometimes I'm back done by six 30. And it's unbelievable how much you can get done when you wake up a few hours early every day. They say if you wake up two hours early every day, you add another month to your life or to your year. Two hours early every day, you literally get 13 months out of a year as opposed to if you went to bed or, or you lost that two hours. Amen, man. It's been the most powerful habitual shift that I've made in, my, in the entirety of my life and, and all these little incremental attempts to get leverage and momentum getting up earlier is, has been the number one and it's funny how much you know I ask a lot of people about their morning rituals and everybody kind of has a different essentially every pe people have a different code for it or different language but they're all saying the same thing you know it's uh it's, I mean, that's these clues yeah yeah it's, I mean health uh strategic planning for the day touching key people setting like primary objectives for the day uh, and, and just, you know, taking that early time, new information, whether it's meditative or it's audio books or it's journaling. Yeah. It, it's just universal, man. Well, Brad, this has been amazing. I, I honestly, I wish we had more time. I'm excited that we are going to have more time because I'm coming on your show in a few weeks. Um, and I hope we can pick, pick right up with this because, you know, I've followed you for a long time, but there's no, uh, no substitute for getting to, to talk directly with someone. You talk about relationships. That's why I started this show. This, I'm not a podcaster by trade. It's not even, it's, Frank, it's the, the lowest direct ROI portion of my time or my business. But in the long run, it'll probably be the highest indirect ROI thing that I ever do because of all the relationships that it builds. I, I could have called your office a hundred times and been like, I'm Jeff Lerner. And I'm a stud and Brad needs to talk to me. Can you get him on the phone? And they, unless I was like, I'll pay $50,000 an hour or whatever your direct fee. I mean, they probably wouldn't have patched me through, but I have a show and you build momentum in the show. You build, you know, you take it a day at a time and you grow a thing. And now you get to go build relationships with people that you might've been following on social media for years. This is a case in point. So I appreciate yeah, you. Coming dude, on. You're, you're hundred percent right. I mean, dropping bombs. I started dropping bombs maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, maybe. Um, and I started it because my, 
my big thing is I want to get the knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. So I, br I had a lot of big names coming in here, Tony Robbins, Grant Cardone, right? Because they're filming for their VT system. They use my software to sell uh, training. So I thought, why not get a couple microphones and, you know, pick their brain while they're here. So I started out with that intention, with that goal in mind. And ultimately now, like, I got Michael Rappaport. You, I, you know who that is? Yeah, yeah, of course. Dude, he was in one of my favorite movies of all time called True Romance. But anyway, yeah. Michael Rappaport's coming on. Tommy Lawrence or Laren's coming on. Um, I've had Dr. Buttar. I mean, uh, Patrick Bet David. Like, dude, I met so many people. Well, I mean, I knew them actually before this, but some of them I met right here. And dude, if you don't have a podcast in my mind, you know, that's one more thing you should write down on your to-do list. Anybody, everybody. Why? Well, number one, just what you said. Number two, I believe that, uh, well, it's, it's, it is getting a little bit busy now, but I believe that everybody that has a podcast will, will get an ROI somehow, some way, no matter what. Yeah, I believe it 100% if you are, are what you should be with any significant endeavor worth doing, which is play the long game, be consistent, and focus on quality. And focus on excellence. I mean, yeah, anyways, I, I couldn't agree more. Well, I'm excited to be on your show and I'm super grateful that I got to have you on mine. Uh, not that probably everybody listening doesn't already know, but how can people go enroll into your world and get more of this great stuff? Really just follow me on Instagram. I drop two posts every day with little nuggets of, uh, you know, wisdom, let's call it, you know, there's a little entertainment in there, but ultimately uh, I just follow me on Instagram. You can go to Brad Lee, which is LEA, bradlee.com. That's got everything I'm up to, but, yeah, you know, I'm not really pushing anything. I do have a book coming out, um, but, but uh, bradlee.com is like, if you want to see what I'm doing, clothes, books, mm -hmm. things that I'm doing, go there. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thanks again for being a part of Millionaire Secrets, and thanks as always to, to my audience who tunes in and who's uh, hopefully just obsessive and ruthless and unrelenting in their pursuit of their own personal greatness. I hope that today has uh, given you some value. Take care, everyone. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.